Compression in loudspeakers. One of the worst things that could possibly happen as you turn up the volume is you're losing output. By that, I mean, if you turn up the volume 10 decibels, you expect the volume to get basically twice as loud, at least through the mid range. Unfortunately, if you have a speaker that doesn't handle you know, a lot of power well, that output doesn't actually go through to the speakers. It just gets stopped short. The speakers say, you know, I can't handle this. I can't dissipate the heat enough or I'm warming up too much and I'm unable to take the power that you're giving me, the signal that you're giving me and deliver that as music to my audience. So maybe instead of 10 decibels of output, you're getting something like five or eight or some other number. But not only is compression a linear thing where it affects all frequencies the same, it can also affect frequencies differently. You could have compression in low frequencies and none at high frequencies, which would leave you with a very shrill sounding speaker as you turn up the volume or as you listen at longer intervals. You could have compression through the mid range, but maybe not so much in the mid bass, which would leave you with a very hollow sounding speaker over time. And these are all things that can be measured. And that's what I provide in my reviews. So in this video, I'm going to talk to you about how I perform my compression tests and what they mean to you in the real world scheme. For the purpose of this video, I'm going to provide you with two very different speakers. What you can see here is a, an iPhone picture of a Klipsch Heresy 4 speaker, and then a PreSonus Aries 3.5, I believe is the model number. And the speaker on the left, the Klipsch, incorporates a 12 inch midwoofer, a, I think it's a compression driver mid-range, uh, which is right here, and then a horn loaded tweeter at the top. And the overall sensitivity of the speaker is about, I think it's 94 dB at 2.83 volts, one meter. This speaker right here is a powered little three inch mid-range driver with I think a, maybe a one inch dome tweeter and it's meant for near field monitoring use. And yeah, in the real world, nobody's really gonna compare purchasing these two, but they provide enough of an extreme difference that it makes it easier to understand what the effects can be of compression. The first test results I'm gonna talk with you about are what I call short term or dynamic compression testing. That's when I just sweep the speaker with a quick test signal and then I measure the frequency response, and I do that at different intervals. So I start off with a baseline, which is my reference point of 76 decibels. I increase the volume 10 dB and go to 86 dB, and then I increase the volume to 96 dB and then to 102 dB. Now I should note that when I say I increase the volume, I increase the volume by 10 dB or 6 dB, whatever interval I need to get to the next step for the measurement. That doesn't mean that I'm increasing the volume until the speaker registers, because if I were doing that, then that would defeat the purpose of doing the compression testing. The compression testing is rooted in the thought that if I turn up the volume by 10 decibels, I'm expecting to get 10 decibels more of output. And what happens when you have compression is you simply just do not get that. With the short-term compression test or the dynamic compression test, my logic, and this could be flawed, is simply that by doing a quick sign sweep, I'm able to tell what the speaker is capable of producing like that instantaneously. And to me, that would help define the dynamic range because I hear people talk about speakers having dynamic range. And I, I really think they, I think they don't know what they mean. And I've not seen anybody try to define what that actually means. And to me, maybe I'm biased to me, this is probably the best way to define something like that by taking an instantaneous signal and determining how much output you've lost compared to another output. And in this case, the baseline output again is 76 decibels. So let's look at an example. This is the Eclipse Heresy 4. The baseline, which is zero, is referenced to 76 decibels at one meter. The red line represents the output difference that I get compared to what I'm expecting to get. And in this case, the red line should be 86 decibel output comparison. What do I mean by that? Well, 76 dB to 86 dB is 10 decibels of gain. Ideally, the red line will be flat. That would mean that the speaker played 10 decibels louder compared to 76 decibels throughout the entire frequency range, and there was no loss in output or gain in output from some sort of distortion or resonance, which means when you see a red line that is not actually a flat line, 
there is some sort of gain or loss in output compared to what I expected to get. And the y-axis in this graph indicates how much enhancement or gain in output you get, or down here, the negative region, how much compression or loss in output you get. Using the clips as an example at the 86 dB, I expected to get, again, flat line. I'm not getting a flat line. Well, what am I getting? At around 40 hertz, I've lost about, you know, maybe 0.4 dB of output. At around 50 hertz, I've gained about 50 or 0.5 dB of output. And then throughout the mid range, all the way up until about, what is this, 700 or so, 800 hertz, uh, it's reasonably flat. And when you get to this region, around that 800 hertz region, you've lost maybe a quarter of a dB. And then again, you see something similar happening around 1.4 kilohertz, 1.3 kilohertz. And then you see a gain at around, what is this, five, six, between five and six kilohertz, you've got a gain of about maybe 0.3 dB. Now let's take a look at the next step, which is the 96 decibel output line, and that is represented by blue. Same situation, I would hope to have a solid flat line here. I'm not getting that. Where are the deviations? We see that at 40 hertz, at 50 hertz, we've got almost a dB of gain. At, what is this, 800, 700 hertz again, we've got a dB of loss, and it's a pretty steep, narrow filter right there. And then at the same region we saw earlier, we've got a gain of almost one dB in the five to six kilohertz area. Now the next step is ramping it up to 102 dB at one meter output. And 102 dB for a single speaker is really quite loud, but it's important to see what the speaker is doing in terms of output limitations. So in this case, we are seeing the same trends that we saw previously, except they're just growing in scale. Now, the biggest one that I'm noticing is this 700, 800 hertz area, and you've lost over one and a half dB of output. And then up here at the five to six kilohertz region, you've gained about one and a half dB in output. So that's not great, but you kind of have to consider again that you're comparing 102 dB versus 76 decibels. So you gain 26 dB in output, but you've lost or you've gained just a little bit more than that at particular frequencies. How audible is this gonna be? Um, I got to say that if you're listening to the speakers this loud, I don't know that you're really even going to pick up on you losing or gaining, you know, these steep filters. Um, I'm just going to go back again to say that it's not ideal, but if you're listening to a pair of speakers at 102 dB, that's going to be really freaking loud. I mean, a pair of speakers in a room, uh, that gives you another 9 dB because you get 3 dB for double power, 3 dB for the speaker and about 3 dB of room gain. Uh, for the most part, and that, that kind of fluctuates depending on the room and placement of the speakers and whatnot. But that means you're actually at 111 dB at one meter, and then if you are at four meters, you double that, double it again, so that's minus 12, so you're back to about 99 dB of output at four meters. That's, that's pretty darn loud. I mean, when I test speakers, I will do crush testing just to see how high they go. And typically once I hit like 95 dB at four meters, that's plenty loud for me. Now that may not be loud enough for some people, but I can tell you that that is certainly louder than most people will listen to speakers. On average, people tend to listen to speakers between, you know, 80 to 85 to 90 dB, uh, just depending on the content that they're listening to. So that kind of gives you a reference point. Now let's look at the little baby monitor speaker. And this you can see is certainly the extreme situation of that testing. Now, it is important to note that with the monitor speaker, typically what you have with a powered speaker, like a monitor speaker, is that they have built-in limiters, which means that the manufacturer has designed a DSP inside the amplifier so that the power output won't go too high, mainly so you just don't destroy the speaker, blow it up, have warranty issues, and costing them a ton of money down the road because some knucklehead was playing the speakers way too loud. Um, and in this case, that, that may actually be the same thing here, but again, we're using this as kind of an education tool. So let's start off with the 86 decibel line. We expected to go from 76 dB to 86 dB. We would gain 10 dB in output. And again, I would expect that line as a comparator to be flat right here. You know, that, that's the goal for you to have a stack of flat lines, but it isn't. What we're seeing is around 50 to 60 Hertz, you've got a significant gain in the low frequency output uh, that in, that indicates at least to me there's probably some sort of 
ringing. There could be something in the enclosure. It's a plastic enclosure, so maybe there's something going on in the enclosure. Uh, it could be any number of things, but that's kind of just my hunch. Then we work our way to the mid-range area, and we're steadily losing anywhere from about a half a dB to a quarter dB throughout at that volume. And then when you get higher into the higher frequencies, that compression tends to lessen and you get a little bit of a gain, but it's not significant. The next thing is to look at the blue line, which is the 96 decibel line. So I've increased the volume by 20 decibels and I wanna see if I've lost or gained any output there instantaneously. There's a lot of compression here. And I mentioned previously that most speakers like power speakers have built-in limiters. I would guess that that's what's going on in this particular case, even though I'm still seeing some of these profiles, I'm guessing there's probably still some kind of ringing going on in the enclosure and the compressor isn't enough to, or I should say, and the limiter isn't doing enough to knock that down because it's probably not you know, designed to specifically knock down a single frequency. It's just a broadband limiter. That's my guess. And we can see that, yeah, it seems to be that way throughout the mid range. And then when you get to the higher frequencies, there's less compression or probably limiting going on with this particular speaker. Now you may be wondering, where is the purple line? You know, where's my 102 decibel mark? Where's my 76 plus 26 decibel mark? And you can only imagine that if the 96 dB is gonna have this much compression or, or again, probably limiting going on, then the 102 dB is probably gonna have much more than that. And sure enough, the purple line is probably way down here somewhere because my scale only goes to plus or minus three dB. And just because the fact that it's not on here tells me that it's way off somewhere else and I didn't even bother to check. This is one of those cases, again, where you kinda gotta use your brain, you gotta think, this is meant for near field monitoring listening. They're $100 a pair. They're three inch mid woofer with a one inch dome tweeter. I believe it's a one inch. And odds are you're probably not gonna be listening to it any louder than maybe 80 dB or so uh, a few feet away from it. You wouldn't buy this speaker for far field listening for a home theater. And if you do, then that's your fault for buying the wrong speaker. But it is good to have the data that tells us the limits because if I wanted to compare against another speaker that was similar in price or similar in size, then we would have this data to make that comparison with. The other form of compression testing that I do is long-term compression testing. Now, the idea here is that if you're listening to music for a while at a certain volume, we're gonna say 86 dB because that's close to average music listening levels, then over time, it's possible for the components inside the speaker, such as the resistors and the crossovers, the actual voice coil of the drive units themselves to heat up and they start to lose the ability to produce more output. And that's what this test was designed for. So what I do is I sweep the speaker, get its frequency response. Then I play multi-tone stimulus for about two minutes at that particular SPL. So depending on what SPL I'm testing for, and we'll discuss that shortly. And then I sweep the speaker again, and that tells me have I lost anything in terms of the frequency response between the initial sweep and this intermittent sweep? Then I play the noise again for another two minutes and sweep one last time. And now I've got a notion of what the speaker is gonna do for a longer period of time. Now, you may wonder, why wouldn't you test for five minutes at a time or 10 minutes at a time or 20 minutes at a time? Well, that goes back to looking at some of what the standards are and what other manufacturers do. Uh, there's a couple IEC standards out there that call for testing for only one minute. And then I believe it's two minutes of rest and then another minute and two minutes of rest. ScanSpeak does something similar like this with their drive units. And I actually feel like the way I'm doing it is more stressful than what the IEC standard calls for. And certainly I'm, I hate to say I'm making this up, but nobody else told me to do this. I just kind of went on this based on my own experience with testing you know, hundreds of drive units over the years. And I also don't want to risk potentially damaging a speaker. I feel that the two minute and then the four minute testing will give us a good idea of what the speaker is trending toward. And you've got to also remember that when you're talking about listening to speakers and you're comparing to my test results, I'm testing one speaker. You're listening to two speakers in a room. So you got that additional SPL. So while you may not think that 86 dB is a stress test, Keep in mind that 86 dB at your listening position is probably closer to about you know 83 to 89 dB at one meter anechoic. Let's look at the first example, which again is gonna be the Eclipse Heresy 4. The layout of the graph here is the same as what we talked about with the short-term testing. Same x-axis, 
same y-axis scale. With this particular test, the output volume is 86 dB at one meter, and then I run the stimulus for two minutes and then another four minutes, all at that same volume. Ideally, there would be no change in these lines. They would all be dead flat, and any deviation from flat indicates that the frequency response is not the same as it was initially. And what I'm learning from this test is that with this particular speaker, which is the Eclipse Heresy 4, and remember, this is a highly sensitive speaker, at least in terms of you know, most of the other speakers on the market today. The interesting thing to me with this particular test is that after four minutes, the compression is actually decreased and you actually have more enhancement. And this kind of makes you wonder, you know, what's going on here. And unfortunately, I don't have that answer right now. I'm not going to pretend to. I'm just wondering if it might have something to do more with distortion than actual voice coil compression in the midwoofer, or maybe there's something going on in the enclosure. <laughs> I don't know but it is interesting nonetheless. Having said that, um, for the most part then, this speaker is dead flat. You know, there's no deviation throughout the most of the audible band region, and I would consider this a really good test. So now let's look, so now let's look at my secondary test for the long-term testing. My second long-term test is done at 96 dB at one meter, and that, as I said previously, is pretty darn loud. And again, we're seeing the same kind of thing here where the output really doesn't change from when I played it initially to two minutes later or even four minutes later, running full tilt at 96 dB. And it's worth mentioning that the stimulus that I'm using is a multi-tone stimulus with a 12 dB crest factor. And the multi-tone stimulus is used to kind of replicate like music signal. If you've heard pink noise, it's very similar to that. It's not the same thing, but it's similar. 96 dB at one meter pink noise, that exercises the speaker pretty darn well, at least in my humble opinion, in my experienced opinion. Now we're gonna look at the long-term testing for the little PreSonus three and a half uh, studio monitor. And in this case, you can see that it is quite different. This is at 86 dB and this is the long-term testing. And what we see here is there is definitely some loss in throughout the mid range, but it's not great. You know, it's about a quarter dB or so for both the two minute and the four minute mark. But the two kilohertz region is definitely experiencing some gain. And what I would say that this is probably gonna sound like, this could potentially sound kind of screechy um, because you gotta keep in mind that what you've been used to listening to or what you started out listening to has changed over time. With 86 dB, that's, probably more along the level of what most people are going to be listening to in the near field uh, and it may actually be a little bit higher. So I say all that to say that these results don't look great, but we're going to see worse. Told you we were going to see worse. This is the same speaker at 96 dB at one meter. And after just two minutes, look how much compression you've got throughout the mid range. You've lost a dB You've got some craziness going on where you're gaining over two and a half dB in, uh, in this particular area around the 1.6 or so kilohertz region. Uh, the high frequency is doing some kind of weird stuff, uh, especially when you get out to up here. I mean, it's just, man, it's all over the map. And then the four minute mark is even worse. You're losing one and a half dB of output. I mean, it's just, it's, this one's crazy. So I think this does a good job of kind of giving you an idea of where the limits of a speaker are. And for this speaker, certainly this is not made for listening at higher output volumes uh, for any sort of time. I mean, I wouldn't even say just a minute, but that's my opinion, at least based on what I'm seeing. And that's really it for the compression testing. I mean, it's, it's very straightforward testing. All you've really got to remember is everything is based on a comparison. So with my short-term dynamic testing that I'm doing, everything is referenced to 76 dB. And with my long-term testing, everything is referenced to the same output level. It's just over an extended period of time. In my opinion, this is really great information to have, especially again, when you're talking about, you know, studio monitors, powered speakers, you can definitely see when their limiters kick in. And it's not just happening with these cheapy, you know, $100 budget monitors. Uh, it happens with more expensive monitors as well. So that's something that I encourage you to pay attention to in my data. And I appreciate you guys watching. I hope you learned something. And if you have any questions, make sure you leave them in the comments below. Hopefully I've addressed all of your concerns to this point, but I'm certain that there is somebody who has something to say. So with that said, I'm out. You guys take care. I'll talk to you later. Peace.